And so the, the two eigenvalues here are lambda equal minus 6 and lambda equal plus 1. So because we have this plus 1 eigenvalue, that makes the system unstable. Okay? All right, so that was, that was part 1. All right, moving along. Part 2, I asked you to find the transfer function between x1, right, this is a vector, x obviously here is a vector, it has two components called x1 and x2, and I'm asking you to find the transfer function between the input u and the output, I'm essentially telling you x1. So we, if you take the second equation there, I'm just write it out in scalar form, dxt, dx2 dt is what, uh, 4, oops, sorry, 4x1 minus 3x2 minus 4u, I think. I'd like to think I could do that correctly. Yes. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take a Laplace transform of this equation. So I'm going to get this, right? If I take Laplace transform of the derivative, there's going to be an initial condition here, but it, as usual, we're going to assume it drops out and not worry about it because we're assuming we're dealing with deviation variables. Otherwise, I have to tell you something about it, which I didn't. So, so this will be 4x1 minus 3x2 minus 4 times u. And so what I aspire to do is use this equation to eliminate x2. So I'm going to solve it in terms of x2. So S plus 3 here. Just to make sure that I'm not making any mistakes. I, should just, I should just trust myself. OK, so I get this expression here, which hopefully you can read. I'm trying to write my neatest, um, which get, get allows you to eliminate um, x2 in terms of x1 and u. Okay, so that's what I use for the first equation. And then if you take the second equation, I mean, the reason I want to eliminate x2, because I told you in the problem statement, I want the whoops, transfer function between u and x1. So I need to eliminate x2. So I'm going to use this equation here to eliminate x2. So we look at this minus 2. Is that right? Little u. Looks good. OK. So now I'm going to take the Laplace transform of this equation. Again, don't worry about the initial condition unless I tell you explicitly to do so. Minus 2x1 OK. And now I have the expression for x2. I'm going to plug it in there. Plug in x2 right there. x2. OK. So you get that. Um, so now you have an equation involving only x1 and u, which is what you want, because you, you aspire to find the transfer function between x1 and u. So at this point, so we can get through the whole exam, rather than do all the algebra, I'm assuming if you got the problem to this point, you could find x1 in terms of u. Okay, it's just algebra. So if you don't mind, rather than go through that, which I'm sure you can do, I'll just write the answer. So when, you're, when it's all said and done, you're going to get x1 of s. Of course, I can't remember. I can't see that. Okay, can everyone read that? So numerator is 2s minus 6, denominator is s squared plus 5s minus 6. Okay. And you might um, notice, see the denominator here? 
s squared plus 5s minus 6. Here's the characteristic polynomial, lambda squared plus 5 lambda minus 6. They're, they're the same polynomial, which it, it'll always be that way. Okay? Right, because I told you in the past, the eigenvalues of the A matrix are the same as the poles of the transfer function. Okay. All right, so then I ask you, which is pretty easy, find the zeros. So to find the zeros, you set the numerator polynomial, which in this case is equal to 2s minus 6 equal to 0. And obviously, from there, you can get s equal, what, 3? Plus 3. OK, that's a, one of those right half plane zeros I've talked about. Okay. And then the, to find the um, poles, you set the denominator polynomial equal to 0. And we already know what those are, because they're the same as the eigenvalues. They're s equal what, uh, minus 6 and plus 1. Okay. So from this, you can conclude the system. Let me, I'm not sure exactly what terminology I used here. OK. Remember, I introduced this idea of the system being uh, minimum phase or non-minimum phase. I, went, I told you if you show the zeros and you plot them in the complex plane like this, over here, this region we call minimum phase, MP. And then over here, if the zero has a positive real part, we call that non-minimum phase. And if you plot the zero here, you're going to have a zero right there, plus three, right? OK. And then obviously here you can say um, system is unstable. You already know that from the previous part anyway. All right, so that was part two. You can ask questions along the way if you like. Maybe this is better than projecting it on the board in the long run anyway. All right, so let me read part C. I can see it, but part, part, so this exam, geez, pretty aggressive. Uh, there's t eight parts, okay? Um, so we've done two of the eight parts. But remember what I promised you, and I came through in the first exam. You have to agree, right? I promised you shorter exams, and I did it the first time. The average was, low, I think, 72 or 73. And you can expect the same thing for this one. I'll make it shorter, okay? So don't. Don't panic. But in a way, it's probably good because that way you have more problems you can see and more problems to practice. But it'll be shorter for you guys, so don't worry. All right. But 3 says, um, OK, I'll read it to you if you don't have it. Consider a proportional controller and then use the Ruth method to find the range of controller gains for which the system, close up system, is stable. OK? And then it has a second part that says, prove that the closed loop system is stable for kc equal minus 2. In other words, kc equal minus 2 should be in the range that you prove it's stable for. Okay? So we want to apply the Ruth method to this. And this involves forming the um, characteristic equation. So I'm going gonna, gonna to start erasing over here because I can't see the answer any longer. I might keep the, I don't know if I need the original system or not. Probably not. So, where's that ginormous eraser? Okay. So, what we want to do is, um, first of all, we have to form, to apply this test, you have to form the characteristic equation, which is 1 plus g times gc equals 0. In the notes, it, it'll say, you know, GB, GM, GP, GC. But remember, we now we're lumping everything into G, right? G is the process, the measurement device, and the valve all put together. So we've simplified things to look like this. And I'm telling you for this problem, like, just find the range of controller gains that make this system stable. So you have 1 plus KC here times whatever the transfer function was, which I've already forgotten. It's over there, OK? 2s minus 6, and this is, I think, s squared plus 5s minus 1 equals 0. OK? All right. Now, this problem is going to end up being particularly easy because the polynomial is just going to be second order. And you, when I went through the Ruth method, I told you, remember, there's these necessary conditions, and there's also sufficient conditions. But it ends up that the necessary conditions are actually sufficient if it's only second order. So it makes it particularly easy, which I'll explain. All right, so we're going to get a polynomial here. Um, 
I'm going to take a few shortcuts here. I'm going to multiply across by the denominator, so I get 5s five, five there. And then what? I'm going to get a 2ks here, 2kc s. And then I'm going to get a minus 6 there. So it looks like I'm going to get a minus 6, 1 plus kc here. Just to avoid doing every step. Let's see if that's actually correct based on this. Looks good. OK. So you remember the necessary conditions for the Ruth method are each one of these coefficients has to be positive. OK? And you recall that if this one is negative, you just multiply the whole thing by minus 1 and make it positive. But right now it's 1. That's positive. So we need 5 plus 2kc. Whoops, sorry. Has to be greater than 0. And then we also have that um, minus 6. 1 plus kc has to be greater than 0. OK? I'll try to avoid writing too low here. Sorry, I forgot about the, the thing. All right, so if we take this 1 plus 5 kc, then we're going to get kc has to be greater than what? Mi uh, minus 5 over 2. I hope that's right. And then for this one, first thing I'm going to do is divide by minus 6. That'll flip the inequality, obviously. And then I'll get that kc has to be um, less than minus 1, OK? Which is what I obtained. OK, so kc has to be greater than that, has to be less than that. So the range in between those is where it's stable, OK? And the reason kc here is negative is because if you go back to the process, whoops, sorry, the process transfer function, g, you set s equal to 0 to find the gain. If you do that, you'll see the gain for this guy is equal to, whoa, not what I expect. It's weird. So according to my calculations, the gain is actually 1. Hmm, fascinating. I expected the gain to be negative. Because the controller gain, the range of controller gains is negative, right? This range is negative. And so I expected the process gain to be negative, because usually the two multiplied together have to be positive. I have to think about this one. Don't think about this now. It's just going to confuse you. All right? <coughs> Skip that for a second. I'll, I'll probably figure it out before we're done. All right. So there's the range. So in principle, you should actually write it like this. This is usually what I'm looking for. Um, minus 5 over 2. OK, so that just write it like that. I mean, if you had that, I'd give you all the points. But that's what I'm looking for. There's the range where it's stable. Now, if you look at the solution, um, I've done more than I need to do. Not sure why I got overzealous here. But the problem statement says, prove that Kc minus 2 works. OK? So the question is, is this stable? I did additional work, but all you have to do really is say it's in the range. <laughs> it's in between there. If it's in between there, it's stable. And then just say yes. That'll be fine. I'm not sure. I, I took the case equals minus 2, plugged it in the character equation, found the poles, found they were both negative, which you already know because it's in that range. But So it's fine what I did, but it's more than you need to do. That's the point. So let's just do it the easy way. All right, cool. Now we've done that. All right. Part D is the material we just covered yesterday. So it says, well, actually, this one's um, we covered before. It's the same massive lecture on direct synthesis and IMC. So the, the third problem is design a direct synthesis controller and basically show it doesn't work. And the second, the next part is do the IMC design. So just doing both of those. OK, so the fourth part is do direct census design and consider GD equal this thing. 
Remember in the direct synthesis method, I have to tell you what I want the response to set point changes to be. We call that transfer function GD. And I've told you in the problem statement that it's that. In other words, the tau C, we like to call it, is 1 half. Okay. There's a reason I picked 1 half as being a reasonable number. Um, but I won't bother explaining it. You don't need to worry about it. But it's in relation to the time constant of the process, but you have to calculate that. You don't need to. But anyway, so there's what you have. All right, so you want to do a des direct synthesis design. There's, a, there's an equation in the notes that tells you that the controller transfer function looks like this. 1 over g, sorry, that's a g. 1 over g, 1 over tau c s. Make sure I didn't screw that up. Where am I? Totally lost. Yes. Okay. So, the, so remember, I told you for the direct synthesis design, if you have a, a desired closed-loop transfer function that looks over like one over tau c s plus one, then you can simplify the equation I gave you in the notes to this, which is always in the notes, and this is usually where I start. Just simpler. Okay. So, well, guess what? Plug into this guy. So, was this s minus 6 down here? I've erased it all now. No, it's 2s minus 6. And this was s squared plus 5s minus 6. Okay. That is the 1 over g. And then I multiply that times 1. So I can, this guy is 1 half s. All right. So there's not a lot of simplification to do here. I guess you could do a little bit. Just apply the 1 half here, and you'll get s minus 3 s. OK? All right. So I don't think I asked this in the problem statement, but I, I mentioned in the solution that's not a PID controller, right? So just recall that. If the controller is PID, then we normally write it like this. But you know that's not the most convenient form to compare. So the mo more convenient form is where you get a common denominator. And in that case, it looks like this. Whoops. OK, so what's the ah, yes. So in other words, if it's a PI controller, it's going to be S squared in the numerator. If it's just PI, it'll just be S in the numerator. But the denominator has to be just a constant times S, regardless. Okay? That's not a constant times S. right? That's S minus 3 times S. S minus 3 is not a constant. So th that's not a PID controller. Now, if I were to ask you, does this controller have integral action, you'd say yes, because it has this 1 over s term. They'll always have integral action if you design them properly. If you make a mistake, maybe not. Yeah? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just write it over here, but yeah, in case it should be there. Hmm? Um, yeah, so if I ever ask you if the controller has... If I ever ask you if the controller has integral action, what you want to do is simply plug in 0 for s and see if it is infinity. That means it has a factorable 1 over s. That represents integral action, 1 over s, right? All right. I don't ask you that. I'm just adding stuff now. I just feel like I have total free control. <laughs> don't have to look at the notes or adhere to them whatsoever. OK. So there's a, there's a um, direct synthesis controller, this guy right here. And I must ask something more about it. What do I say? Oh, sorry. I lied. I do ask you if it's a PID controller. OK. So again, if you want to know whether something's a PID controller, just write the PID controller like that, always. Take that, compare it to that. See if they can be made equal. They cannot be made equal, because the denominators cannot possibly be equal to each other. So no, it's not. Okay, you're done. And then I, the last thing I ask, which seems, I'm not sure how I did it in the solution, but I ask you, um, is, the st is the controller stable? Yeah. Okay. 
So first of all, I'm writing, this is the way we normally write the PID controller. Hopefully you can read what I wrote. And what I've done is get it over a common denominator because it's easier to work with that way. <coughs> and then this is the transfer controller transfer function I got from the design procedure. And I'm trying to look and see, is, can, is, can this thing possibly be the same as this? In other words, do there exist definitions of tau i, um, tau i and k, sorry, tau d, tau i and kc that make it equal to that? You can see because of, you see this thing here, can't possibly, it doesn't matter how I pick tau i, tau d, or kc, those things can't possibly be made equal to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, the last part is I ask you, is the controller sta stable? All you really have to say is no, the controller has a pole at s equal plus 3. That makes the controller unstable. So if you look at this denominator, you have this term. That's to give the term integral action. That's OK. But this s minus 3, so what I did in the notes is I said, if I want to, I can write the controller to be the ratio of two polynomials. And the stability of the controller is determined by the roots of the denominator polynomial, like always. Okay. And that's this s minus, what is it, 3 times s. And that is s equal plus 3. That means it's not stable. Okay. We already told you this last time. If you have a system that has, where are we? This thing here, right, which is a right half plane 0. It's non, it's non minimum phase. You can't use this method and get a stable controller. So this is the result you expect. Okay. All right. On to part 76. No, I'm just kidding. On to part E. So now I ask you to do the IMC design for this. And recall to do the IMC design, I'm sure I, I have to check this, but I can't imagine I didn't take the IMC filter thing to be the same as GD because they have the same exact same meaning. But let me check and make sure. I did. OK. All right, so you remember the key thing here. So what do we have? We have our transfer function G of S. It looks like this. And um, I'm going to factor this into two parts. Right. I'm going to factor it into a part, the bad part, that I cannot invert, and then the part I can invert. And then I do the rest of the design using this guy right here. The key is to get the right G plus, as we talked about last time. All right, so here's the procedure I use to find G plus again. I did three examples yesterday. Here's another one. Okay. First thing I do is I look at my transfer function. I see, is there anything naughty in there? That would include time delays, of which this problem has none, and right half plane zeros, of which this one has one. Okay? This is a right half plane zero, this term. So the first thing I do is put that in the numerator of my g plus. Okay? Now, I told you last time, the way we want to do this factorization, it's called, is to make sure that this thing is the so-called all pass. So that means if you were to plot the pole here, or the zero, sorry. I can barely get there. You have a pole at s equal plus 3. Okay. That means your g plus has to have a pole at minus 3. Okay. Which means in the denominator, you put the same thing with a plus sign instead of a minus sign. Okay. Then you check the gain of this thing. The gain, you substitute s equals 0. You can see the gain is, is written now as minus 1. The gain has to be plus 1, so now you put a minus sign there. Okay, That's your g plus. Since that's your g plus and that's your g, it's not hard to find out what the g minus is. It's equal to minus OK, so that's the g minus. OK, and then I ask you to design the IMC controller, which means all you have to do now, remember the IMC controller has this asterisk. The formula for that given in the notes is 1 over g minus times f. Okay. So there's the g minus, there's the f. You can plug it in there. There's a minus sign here, sorry.
I don't know if I chose to simplify it any further than that. I usually get overzealous, yeah. So I did some simplification. Not sure it's really, well, no, it's not really required. That would be fine. Okay. So you can see this, sorry, again, that's a minus sign right there. So you can see this controller is actually stable, right? Because instead of having that unstable thing in the denominator, we have that stable thing in the denominator, 2s plus 6. All right. So I could, in principle, ask you, which I don't in this problem, now that you have that, please give me the regular feedback controller GC. There's a formula for that. It usually involves a lot of algebra, I told you. And I told you sometimes I'm not going to ask you to do that because it simply becomes an exercise in algebra. The ex if the algebra is easy, I might ask you to do it. But in this case, you're done after you do this. No need to plug and do all the additional stuff to get the regular feedback controller, which is good. OK. Part. 6, which I'll go back over here. So if you asked me what would I like, so this part, this exam has eight parts. I would, like, this is the level of complexity you can expect in terms of the, the manipulations you have to do. More than likely, if I were to redo this exam, the same exact exam for you guys, I would just cut out the last two problems. It would be like six parts instead of eight or something like that. Okay? All right. So okay. I always give this argument. But at this point, if you look at the exam, I haven't asked you to do anything that's even remotely new or challenging. <laughs> at least that's my perception. Okay? Now, this is, this, you haven't seen this a lot, but it's, it's in the notes. And if you understand the notes, you can just pull out your notes and do the same thing I did with a different transfer function. It, it's not that difficult. Okay. Um, it's helpful if you know what you're doing. I, I mean, the exam's going to be shorter, but it's not going to be so short that you, if you don't know what you're doing, you can figure it out during the exam, right? So you have to kind of know what, what, where to find the formulas and things. But they're all available. It's open book. So, um, as long as you know what you're doing, you should be fine. So this is the first part where, in principle, you might have to think a little bit. Okay. So I ask you the following. I tell you that I'm interested in a set point change that's equal to 1 over s. Okay. And then I want you to find the closed loop response for this. In, the, but maybe the better way to look, look, I want you to find this. What is that transfer function between the output and the set point? OK? And once you have it, then you plug in this for that. I mean, that's, that's trivial to do that. OK, so there's a couple of ways you could do this. But the simplest way, by far, is if you look in the notes, I have the following formula. And this goes back to understanding why you're doing the design in this way in the first place. I tell you that this thing is equal to f, well, change the order here, g plus of s times f of s. Okay? And I explained this yesterday. I said, so what we have here is the part, this is what we want the relationship to be, right? If you gave me a choice, I would take the transfer function between the set point and the output to be exactly f of s. It's first order. It's got a tunable time constant as a gain of 1. It's the same thing as gd. But because the system is non-minimum phase, we get another part here we can't get rid of. So it's still there. Okay. You could figure this all out if you, you know, I could write this as, you know, gc plus g over 1 plus g times gc. Plug in the g and gc, do a tremendous amount of algebra, and eventually you'd end up with this. Okay. So this is an example where it would be wise just to start with that. Okay. So once you get to that, well, suffice it to say that's not too challenging because you have the G plus. So it's, is it over there somewhere? You see it over there? Way over there? Um, so I've canceled the 2, so I've written it as S minus 3 over S plus 3, just factoring 2 out of the denominator and numerator there. And then I've multiplied by the f, which is that, and that's it. So I'm saying this is an example. If you do it the right way, it'll take you like 20 seconds. If you do it the wrong way, it could take you like 10 minutes. 
Because again, you could say, well, this is equal to one. I'm sorry. Your tendency might be, God, <laughs> I'm hitting the wall here. OK. So this is also true, right? And you could plug in, you have a G and you have a GC. You could plug it in there and do a bunch of simplification. Eventually, you'd end up with this. It'll take you a lot longer. So it's bet, uh, much better to start here. OK. So and then since I'm interested in what this thing will be, um, and I told you what the set point change is going to be. It's 1 over s. You can figure that out. Just multiply across by that. And I actually give you the answer here because you need the answer for at least the seventh part, if not the eighth part. So it's, that's the way the tests are formulated, right? I give you the answer because they're multiple part questions. And that way, you can proceed in, if you get stuck. Also, if you get the a different answer than me, you can assume my answer is right. Although occasionally, I get five students coming up within a few minutes saying they got the same answer and it's different than mine, which usually means my answer is wrong. Okay, But just continue with um, the answer that's given for the part before. All right, so there's, the, there's y over y set point. So now if I want y, just multiply this across by 1 over s. It's not too hard. In fact, it's not even hard at all. What was this thing? OK. Now, um, in part, yes. Looks like I've done a lot of extra work in part six because I know where I'm headed. Okay. But at this point, you don't need to do that extra work. You can answer part six directly. So what I ask you is prove that, um, so it says use the final value theorem to show that the IMC controller eliminates offset. So this is the closed loop response of the IMC controller. The, the final value theorem says this, the limit as t goes to infinity, and this was covered in the first like three weeks of the course, or like the first two weeks actually. Okay, of, so this is what I'm interested in, right? What is the limit of y of t goes to infinity? Why am I interested in this? Because I can see where y goes. I've done a set point change of magnitude 1. So that means it looks like this. My set point change right, started at 0. It went up to 1. I want to see if the output goes to 1. If the output went to 1, there's no offset. Otherwise, there is offset. To do that, I have to know where the output goes when time gets really large, because right? that's where the output goes. Um, I do not want to take the inverse Laplace transform of this thing at this point. You can probably see why, even though I make you do it in the next part anyway. <laughs> All right? So I'm going to use this theorem. It says this is true. So if you want to know where the output goes when time equals infinity, you can just take the y, which we have right here, y of s, multiply that times s, and take the limit as s goes to 0. This may seem a little bit strange, right? Because s is there. You take s equals 0, you think it's going to be 0. But actually, you're always going to have a case where that s cancels like an s in the y.